Hey, hey, what is up, everyone? Make sure you push the button so you can actually hear me. I should probably do that. Um, welcome to another episode of The Company Next Door. Today, I've got a special guest. I'm here in his office. Super stoked for this one. We've had some time to chat uh, beforehand, and we really were spending a lot of time talking about animal encounters with Scott. Yeah. So I'm debating if we should actually talk about what I was going to talk about or just stick on the shark thing. <laughs> we can do it. We can talk sharks if you like. <laughs> you bet, man. <laughs> so this is Scott Abbott. Um, and hi, everyone on YouTube. Um, Scott Abbott. I'm going to just do a, a brief, tiny version of an introduction because I, I don't even know all the things he's involved in. But started a company called Five Star Painting back in the day. Uh, I don't remember what year it was. 2004. 2004. Mm -hmm. Anyway, grew. It became one of the largest painting franchises in America. Mm -hmm. Correct me if I say anything wrong. Um, over 150 locations, five countries. He ended up selling that to the Dwyer Group. Mm -hmm. And then you, you started a company in the meantime that was this, kind of the support, the, the hub of what made that company so successful called ProNexus, which is a software call center kind of company. Exactly, yeah. Okay. And that's just a little version, but we're not going to go too deep. We're going to save some for the story. Okay. So first of all, thanks for letting me come down and, and spending some time with you. Yeah, thanks for coming. And, and thanks for the shark stories. I hope they, they come back out in, in a later moment. At any moment. <laughs> shark attack could happen. So, Scott, you grew up in Winnipeg, which is not America. That would be Canada. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Is it, you know, because when I think about Canada, I think about, you know, Conan O'Brien. I think about Jim Gaffigan's got a new skit about Canada. You think about ice hockey. He's funny, yeah. And, and that's about, and nice people. Sure, they're nice. Those are the yeah. four things. Is that true? Did that happen? Uh, yeah, so Winnipeg is um, also known as Winterpeg. Okay. It's uh, <laughs> one of the coldest cities in North America. I think it's ranked second or third in North America. Like how, uh, co how cold? Like So uh, I've experienced minus 55 Fahrenheit. Yeah, no one should ever experience it, that. It's inhumane. I, growing <laughs> up, I, you know, every Canadian has to play hockey. I've played hockey most of my life. Uh, and there'd be many times where you go play and you come home and your feet were completely numb because they'd frozen while playing and you'd have to thaw them out for over a few hours and feeling would, it would come back in a day or two. <laughs> so that was kind of how, and, and I'm not actually exaggerating. I know some people <laughs> might think I am, but I'm not. It's no, legit. It gets really cold up there. Um, if, but, if you're not a good hockey player, are you looked down upon? Or I mean, do, are girls going to date a guy who can't play hockey? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, I wasn't that good. Okay. I just played, and I, I got girls to date me as well, okay. so it was okay. <laughs> uh, but, um, but yeah, hockey is definitely, definitely, it's definitely part of the culture of Canada. Okay. And to this day, even living in the States, I'm now American as well. Okay. Dual uh, citizenship. I am dual okay. citizen, yeah. But uh, whenever hockey's played, and it's you know, the Olympics, and Canada's playing in the U.S., I always cheer for Canada. Wow. And I'll, and I'll, wow. Maybe see, we should edit that see, part. This, this is the no. reaction you're having right now is my neighbor asked me that question. So do you cheer for the U.S. now that you're American? I'm like, not against Canada. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Canadian hockey. It's no, as good for as it sure. gets. Yeah. So what was it like? I mean, those temperatures sound kind of crazy. Were you, you're, are you just outside as a kid? Are you, were you thinking about business? I mean, were you, were you out washing cars? So uh, speaking to like just growing, I think things have changed, obviously. I haven't lived in Winnipeg in the wintertime since 2005. Okay. So it's been a while. It's been 15 years since I've been back. I, I made the mistake of going back uh, on, uh, it was American Thanksgiving in November, right? Because we do yeah. a Thanksgiving here in November. In Canada, we have in October. It's a month oh. earlier. Yeah, it's wrong. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I was there for, I flew in, and I'll never forget getting off the plane and then going out just to cross into the to get a taxi or something, and there was a piece, a, like a newspaper, the Winnipeg Free Press, and the front cover it said, "Winnipeg, colder than Mars, minus 52." Oh man! And I was quickly reminded of how cold it can get there. Now that I'm, I'm giving the extremes. Yeah. Normally, uh, winter kind of hits late November, and it goes away April sometime, okay. and really gets cold in the minus 40s. Okay. Uh, January, February. But I, I actually look at that and go, uh, it helped make me who I am. It's a, I look at anything that is difficult in life, seamless response, right? If yeah. you have something hard, it, it hardens you. It, it helps you become a stronger person. Sure. So um, I actually, to that, it's kind of funny, I've left Canada, but I, uh, I shower cold. Oh, okay. Now. And Wim Hof, I, yeah. Yeah, I do the, I'm a big Wim Hof. Yeah, yeah, I my do wife is too. So she drug me into the into the lake in in, in January. Is did she really? Yeah, it's crazy. She's oh, crazy. up in Park City. Yeah, everybody's crazy. Who that, does that? I've I've wake surfed in, at uh, forty five degrees Fahrenheit up at Jordanelle in yeah. Utah, There's and no it's way. it is cold. <laughs> it is cold. In fact, uh, one last story on, on Canada. So I have a summer home that we are there in the summers, which Canada is gorgeous in the summer times. Right. Uh, many of the people I work with have have visited it, and it's stunning. But uh, we, we went there this year because of COVID. Uh, when the kids got out of school on May 1st. Okay. And that's ice out. So ice had just come off the lake. 
And uh, so I had my two boys with me. I've got three, but two of them are still living with me. And I said to them, you want to go do a polar bear plunge? And they looked at me like, dad, there's just no way. It took me two days to convince them, but I'm a good salesman. Yeah. And so we set it up. I got the drone set up. I got the camera set up and they were like, we're ready to do this. There's no amount of preparation that could get you ready for what was about to happen. No. The three of us, you know, we ran off the dock and jumped in. And uh, because I have a 10 year old and a 17 year old, they jumped a little, you know, not as far as I did. I had to kind of clear them, get past them. So I didn't land on them. And I'll never forget being dunked in, it was 33 degree Fahrenheit was the water temperature. And uh, yeah, I, I, I thought I wasn't going to make it back to the dock. Yeah. I, you know, all the blood left my every appendage and I was flailing to get back on the dock <laughs> and, and back into the sauna to warm up. <laughs> back into the sauna sitting there. Okay. <laughs> so you mentioned earlier, um, before, we, before we came on the airs, um, your father, he, he was an entrepreneur? Yes, he was. And, yeah. and he kind of still is, it sounds like. Yeah. So when you grow up, was he, were, was he kind of, was that the spirit in the house? Was it just, we don't work for people, we're just always inventing, creating, you know, that kind of thing? Or? <laughs> yeah, my dad is a really special person. There's no question. Uh, one of the most unique people you'll ever meet. Um, and uh, the seven kids in my family, I'm family. the second oldest. Wow. Uh, I'm the only entrepreneur out of the seven kids. Huh. And, and I think that's, once again, a seamless response. There are challenges to being an entrepreneur, right? There's not a lot of predictability. So to give you an idea, my oldest brother, he heads up the IT for uh, the Manitoba Lic- Liquor Commission and the Lotteries Commission. An IT job, he's super smart, and he runs the networks huh. for these, you know, very stable jobs. Same employer for, I think, 20 years or Interesting. something. Interesting, yeah. Uh, my younger brother, who's uh, four years my younger, five years my younger, is an actuary. He works for Cigna in Hartford, Connecticut. Brilliant guy. Uh, didn't really want to take on a lot of risk in terms of an entrepreneurship thing. And then there's me, and I'm the only one that's really decided to take that path. Uh, my father was kind enough when I was very young. I was 15 or so when I got my first job at McDonald's, which was a franchise system. There's some irony there in, in this yeah. story, I think. And he just said, you know, Scott, you know, we were really big into fishing and we still are. We do a lot of uh, freshwater fishing. He so said, we got this passion. We enjoy fishing. There's these, these fishing lures we bring in that are kind of custom and special. Why don't we go ahead and import them and sell them to the stores we buy our stuff from? And I said, yeah, sure. And so he kind of exposed me uh, to this idea of maybe making things happen on my own. And I, you know, began that business it was called Bass Brothers Fishing Tackle Distributors. And we had the, the Blues Brothers. Yeah. We had two little bass that were oh. dressed up like Blues Brothers. With sunglasses? And sunglasses oh, and everything. Oh, man. And that was our logo. I love it. And I'll never forget uh, <laughs> two things I've probably learned from that that I've stuck with me over the years. One was uh, I was a short kid when I was younger. So at 15, I think I was like five foot two or something. So I, yeah. I looked like I was 12. All the girls called me cute. That's how bad it was. I wasn't, cute zone. I yeah. wasn't hot. I was cute. I got cute zoned by everybody. <laughs> Sorry, man. So, yeah, I know. That's the way it was. <laughs> I was just a little kid. And um, so I, I remember um, coming into my, my dad's office. He gave me a little side office to work out of. And he gave me the Yellow Page book. He slapped it down on the table. And he said, there's your hit list. Go ahead and look up uh, fishing retail stores and just call through them. Wow. And uh, we had the, you know, the phone was sitting in front of me. And uh, the words call a reluctance is what I know it is now. Back yeah. then, I think it took me an hour yeah. I, one hour. But you, I can't to, believe you even to did dial it. dial yeah. somebody. Just one. And I prayed that no one would answer the phone <laughs> because I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> I got very little coaching, didn't know what I was, how, and I just would call up and I'd say, hey, is the owner in? You know, lame stuff, man. Yeah. Like really bad. And despite all of my inadequacies and inexperience, I still sold a lot of fishing tackle. Wow. Uh, I ended up representing 10 different fishing manufacturers in Canada, across Canada. I had stores I was selling to in Nova Scotia, all the way to BC. And, and you're a 15 year old kid, and you said you're five foot two. Well, so I'm trying to picture started you showing at 15, okay, and ended 20 when I stopped doing it. But yeah, to you, that you point, you showing up, and there's again, who's this kid? Everyone thought I was the employee. Yeah, and so that comes to the next point where I walked into the one of these stores because no one answered my phone, and I wanted to sell them some fishing tackle. <laughs> so I walked in and I asked to see the owner, and this guy is sweeping the the floor, and he said, "Well, you know, who are you?" And I said, "Well, I'm Scott Abbott from Bass Brothers." He said, "Oh, okay. Well, who owns your business?" And I said, "Oh, it's me." He just kind of looked at me and said, oh, respect. That's great. <laughs> and I just felt like I was talking owner to owner. Yeah. And he used to kind of look at me saying, I need to show you respect. Yeah, that's awesome. Even though you're some five foot two little punk <laughs> that's trying to sell me some uh, musky tackle baits. Yeah. And so I, that re- re- reminded me of how you should respect everybody mm. independent of what they look like yeah. or where they're at in their business because you just never know what's going to happen. But you ran that. You and your father did that till you were 20. And so you, it sounds like you learned, I mean, that's a great business school right there. Oh, yeah. you, you learn a ton. Yeah. We, uh, so 
my, my father helped me and coached me, but really it was my business. He gotcha. let me make the mistakes nice. and uh, make, have the successes. And uh, my sister joined me for a little while. And then I, I actually chose to serve an LDS mission when I was 20. Okay. And so when I left, uh, that business was left in the hands of my sister. She decided to pursue education instead. Okay. So it became more of a hobby business than a, the core business. Gotcha. Uh, and really have no ill will towards that at all. But when I came home after two years, it just wasn't the business that um, it could really grow into something special at the point. And right. so I elected to, uh, to do something different. Wow. So and then, I, if I remember correctly, you got into another fishing business because you love fish so much. Uh, yeah. is, is, am I right about that? Yeah, so my dad and I were partners in a few things. We had a, um, a fishing magazine uh, called The Fishing Line or something. And, a magazine about fish? Uh, just how to catch fish, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we wrote fishing articles and stuff like that. And it. Uh, it was really his business. I was supporting that more than anything else. And then uh, similarly to that, he had a, we had an idea around doing fishing tournaments online and uh, – Great. I had a great, a lot of learning experiences from that as well. Uh, it did not work out. That business went bankrupt. It was the first wow. bankruptcy I ever experienced. I was not the only, you know, my dad was literally the founder and owner. Yeah. I owned some of the company as being, I guess, a co-founder of sorts, but really it was his, his, uh, his dream. And uh, it kind of forced me into other areas after that didn't work out. You said earlier when hard, you look back on hard things and, uh, you know, you kind of use them as a catalyst to change, right? Mm-hmm. So I can't imagine you're 20 something going through a bankruptcy. I mean, obviously, your father, but you're part of that. Absolutely. What was that? Yeah. I mean, was that just horrifying, terrifying, or was it? Yeah, it was really, really hard. I, I, horrifying, ter- I don't know. <clears throat> uh, I, I think we have to be, as entrepreneurs, very adapt. You have to be able to adapt. Yeah. And there's no question there's lots of fear that happens and can creep into our lives in all kinds of environments, but I wouldn't say horrifying. I'd say a huh. great learning experience. Yeah. <clears throat> it was hard mainly because, you know, we had this vision. Um, while this was happening, I was you know, dubbed the entrepreneur of the year for my university, for the innovator of the year for Manitoba and Canada. Wow. Uh, we were in the media a lot because the concept we had had a lot of legs and it was really a cool idea. And uh, I had created a system that was statistical to compare 15 species of fish all across North America. It was unique, took four years of research to do it. Wow. And uh, we got a lot of accolades for what we were doing. And uh, we just had the wrong partners who wanted to take control and yeah. they, uh, they forced us into bankruptcy to take that control. And, uh, you know, they wanted me to help the new company moving forward, but I just wasn't prepared to be involved any longer. Yeah. And so the hard part was like, you know, shifting from this vision I had for something and that I really was working so hard towards right. now, like what's new. What, yeah. And, and, and uh, at the time I was uh, married with, I think, one or two kids. Okay. So you got some pressure there and some, you yeah. know, you, you can't just let Definitely it fall apart. Pressure. Yeah. Yeah. I was doing my undergrad in business. Uh, I think it was pretty close to graduating, my undergrad, when wow. that happened. So you were in Utah at this point? Had you gone from Canada to Utah? Oh, no, uh, you're, I'm sorry. You said you were in Manitoba. Yeah, still yeah. living. I okay. went to the University of Manitoba okay. to do my, or my undergrad in, in finance and marketing. Gotcha. And mm-hmm. your wife's from Canada as well. Mm-hmm. So how did you convince her to come to the States? <laughs> what, yeah. deal, what deal did you make, man? <laughs> well, <there, laughs> I'm still making deals. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, um, you know, maybe on that note around the personal – effects of being an entrepreneur and finding a partner, in my case, my wife, who's um, amazing, who can support someone through what can be very, very difficult, right? I mean, right. there's a lot of uncertainty that comes in entrepreneurship. A ton. And so if I could speak to me just for a second, like Please. the only time I've worked for the man, as I call him, or the woman, <laughs> uh, the corporation, was when that company went bankrupt. I had to find a way to put food on the table. Yeah. And I took a job at an accounting firm called BDO Dunwoody. Okay. Uh, it's one of the larger accounting firms in North America. And I think it was the fifth and largest in the world at the time. And I uh, took this job, a suit job, downtown. And uh, there's two things I hate, suits and commutes. <laughs> and they rhyme. And they are horrible. I was driving, you know, 45 minutes every day to go to the office downtown and then 45 di- minutes on the way home. And I was just remember adding up and tabulating all the time I'm wasting of my life driving. Mm. And I hated it. So I had to get away from that. And then uh, the other thing was suits, having to wear a suit all day long. I hated that as well. If you can't tell by our, our kind of culture here at yeah, our own company. Yeah, picked up. It's casual. Yeah, I like that a lot. Yeah, I think it's too. important. But um, when that, that experience happened, my wife saw that I was unhappy. Yeah. And uh, this kind of goes into the five-star painting story. Uh, she could tell I was very unhappy with my employment and what I, was, what I was doing. I needed something more entrepreneurial that could kind of get there. And within six months, I was talking to her about the next dream I wanted to create. Was she just like, whoa, slow down. I want, I, this is good for us right yeah, now. Yeah, I mean, having gone, having gone through that bankruptcy and that entrepreneurship yeah. thing, and, and I've known her since she was 12, okay? So she's known me when I had my first business at 15. We weren't dating. 
Yeah. I just knew her. Uh, she was my sister's best friend. That was okay. convenient. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, so when the time came to, to make that decision, it was one that was heartfelt and thoughtful and, and prayerful mm. and uh, definitely one that uh, she was al- and always has been very supportive of. Um, and, o- and, the, and the journey in entrepreneurship is, you know, rarely easy. Uh, yeah. it's, it's usually filled with a lot of uncertainty and difficulties. So the first several years were very hard on us, but um, I, it's kind of funny. I don't know who's talking about this, but most entrepreneurs, you know, come from that experience of like the grit and the grind and making it happen in 16 hour days and just yeah. like everything you got to do to make that work. And then they get, become successful because if you work hard enough and long enough, you're going to make it happen. Yeah. Get there. And they look back with fondness on that yeah. time of it the grit the and the time. grind. It yeah. was the best sure. time. And then I'm like, but we were dead broke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you sure you want to go back to that? <laughs> no. Well, I'd go back to that now if I had yeah. money. Anyways, it's, it's just, it's interesting. But to, to your question, you know, uh, I wanted to do an, do an MBA, which is why I moved to Utah. Gotcha. Uh, BYU had a program that was an executive program that allowed me to do that in the evenings. And uh, yeah, so I just really said to her, look, it's, you know, I'm going to start Five Star Painting as this idea that we would franchise. I felt like I had enough knowledge of what the, the, uh, the market wanted or needed. Right. And uh, I also wanted to get my hydro education at the same time. And I found a way to do that. And Totally supportive, but you know, we, we head back to Canada every year. We spend two, three months every year yeah. there with the family. Let, let me ask you this because you, you mentioned, do you, I don't know if you can remember this decision to get back in the business, right? After, after kind of getting knocked down, because a constant theme I see interviewing entrepreneurs is this you're going to fail, you're going to get knocked down, it's a matter of getting up. Do you remember that time and walking through and making that decision, like consciously, we're going to do it again? Or was it just like, this is the only way it was ever going to be? Like, I guess I'm also trying to address making decisions, you know, hard mm-hmm. as an entrepreneur, you know, how did you, do you remember navigating that decision at all? Um, so I think to answer the first part of your question, uh, as an entrepreneur, you need to be really confident, okay. right? And believe in yourself. And maybe that belief is even unfounded in the version of yourself that you were when you did what you did. Yeah. Like knowing what I know now, looking back at what I did at that age yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. that inexperience that I had, sure. like I'd never franchised anything. All right. I had no experience franchising and yet I felt like I'd be successful doing right, it. Right. It's irrational. It, yeah. it doesn't make any sense. Like I wouldn't have bet on me if today <laughs> looking back, right. you know nothing about franchising and you're going to franchise it. I don't get it. How, where, where is that coming from? So there is a little bit of that, but, um, you know, and, and there's failures that you experience in life uh, in the, and you can experience in all kinds of things, sports and education, sure. all kinds of places, but you, you, you learn how to overcome those obstacles and the key is believing in yourself. And I think, you know, if I look at what my experience is today and go back to where I was, it is that, you know, I was really confident. I really believed in myself. I had no real fear of failure. Hmm. Uh, and they're learning opportunities. I don't look at them as failure. I've never really had looked at them as yeah. failure. And that um, actually helped me a lot. And I've actually found as I've gotten older, yeah. I would say I'm less confident. Real, that's had. what I was going to ask. So today, today when you make decisions. Than I was when I was 27, yeah. 28. Hmm. Which is really, it shouldn't yeah. be that way. Right. I'm way more thoughtful because I've had enough things happen that I go. Yeah. I you need, realize, that, yeah, I, gotta think I got lucky through. here or whatnot. Yeah. <laughs> I got lucky. Yeah. There's no question I got lucky. That's awesome. Yeah. So you're here in Utah now, you've got, you're doing the school and you're getting ready with Five Star Painting, you start this idea. And I heard you say in one of your, um, in a speech that I saw you give, that you called a thousand painters around the country, yeah. or, or I don't know if it was that number. Sure, yeah. And maybe it was either 20 or 20% of them uh-huh. actually answered their phones. Yeah. So you saw them spending all this money to get attention, to, to get people to call, but they weren't answering their phones and you had a solution. Yeah, this is all coming back to, I think, one of the pieces of our culture and it, it's part of our our DNA in our company is this, this idea of, of, you know, validating through numbers, anything you do. And then always coming back to that, like you need to have that. And, and it, it informs all of our decisions at Pronexus as well today where we're at, but gotcha. coming back to the heart and soul of what happened, you know, uh, we were going to build a painting company and, uh, we felt like franchising was the only way to do it because trying to expand it through the corporate model where we would open up a location that was not franchised and hiring an employee to run it failed every time. Mm. So we thought, well, if we had a franchise model where they paid to own it, they'd skin the game. Now we would be in a position where they they would they'd be aligned with us in becoming successful. So right. as I was trying to figure out how to do this, I'm researching all the different marketing tactics that are out there, how you people are finding customers, and I 
a, a few things happened in this process that were scientific. One is I actually started two companies at the same time. One was mm-hmm. called Paintworks. The other one was called Five Star Painting. We started in the same time for the same full year, and we ran the same ad for both companies on yellow pages for both companies. But the one ad was how we viewed how it should be done. It was hard hitting, ninety nine dollars a room, call now, free estimate, call to action centered. And the other one was very much how our competitors were doing it: mm. free estimates, high quality, warranty your work. You know, call now. And just by introducing this element of pricing to an industry that had never had it right. in the advertising, got was different. So that helped. But the key here is that I put tracking numbers on both of these ads. Okay, and I found that the five star painting ad, the same size on the same page drew one or four times as many phone calls as the competing ad for the other company we were wow. running. So we, we actually called it Five Star Painting because that style worked over yeah. that year way better than the other style. So yeah. that's what made us call it's it It's almost that. like a premium uh, brand and a mm-hmm. more traditional brand. That's right. Uh, and the next we did were more value-driven. Five Star Painting was about yeah. the value. Gotcha. You know, $99, dollars I can get into painting quick without spending a lot of money. Yeah. And uh, the other one was more uh, you know, high class, I would say. Sure. Premium. Gotcha. Um, the next thing we learned was is that uh, in doing this process, I was calling all the painters to find out how they were running their business. And so we created a list of 1,000 painters, and we were calling in all the different markets to do research on this. Throughout the whole U.S.? or U.S. and Canada. Okay. All, the, everywhere. Don't forget Canada. Sorry. Yep. Yep. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, about 20% of all the people answered the phones. And so it became very obvious to me from the very beginning that the customer experience around this was so inferior. Yeah. And if you think this through, you know, think of the incentives, right? A painter has every incentive to answer his phone. He spent, uh, in many cases, they're spending fifteen to $20,000 a year, so $1,000 to $2,000 a month on that yellow page ad. Right. Yet, they didn't answer the phone. Yeah, why? And that's the answer. Yeah. They don't have time. If you are blue collar and you are out there running estimates, meeting with customers, picking up paint, and interviewing employees, all these things are happening. You can't afford because you're not big enough to a uh, full-time person to sit there. And even if you had a full-time person, you only get from 9 to 12 before lunch break, and then from 1 until 5 until dinner, and you've got no one answering the phones on the weekends, no one's answering after 5, no one answering during potty breaks, and ultimately this, that whole method is failing to the point, to the tune of 20% are answered, 80% are missed. Mm. And so I looked at that as this like massive screaming opportunity that yeah, said, it's broken. look, it's broken. If you fix that, then you've got a business model. Hmm. So we fixed that. And we had a business model. <laughs> and we grew really fast. Yeah. And we were one of the fastest growing companies in Utah for like five years straight. How fast? I mean, uh, like I said, I think it was 150 or more franchises. How? By the time we sold it, yeah. Okay. So you were adding 20, 20 uh, a couple a month? 20 so, a year? Or what was the? Yeah. You know, year one, it's like the people who are buying our, uh, well, our very first franchisee, we found off of an advertisement. We had a lawn sign out. His name is Alan Turner, six foot four, uh, black belt in kung fu. Uh, fortunately for me, it worked out for him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but he was our very first sale, August 2005. Uh, just saw the sign. Saw the sign, called me up, went to the website and went, hey, you guys look like a franchise. Are you franchised? And I literally hadn't, had just finished the legal work to be a franchise. And I said, yeah. He paid the full franchise fee like everyone else did. Like wow. the same price we charged everyone else in the United States. Wow. So he bought the first one. Then we, you know, uh, an employee of our Calgary operation bought one. I moved to Utah. A guy I, I served a mission with bought one in Utah. One of our partners opened up one in Vegas. One of his employees bought one in Vegas. So the first few came from employees and family and friends. Yeah. And then, um, you know, we were pretty tech savvy. We really doubled down, tripled down on internet marketing in a, in a time when really it wasn't the thing. Yeah. And uh, we started dominating the keywords of painting franchise, painting franchise opportunity. And we were ranking in the top three all the time for that. And so people would call our competitor who'd been around for 10 or 15 years and was mostly sold out in the good areas and they'd find us next mm. and they'd buy our, our, our territories. And so we found, you know, the first year was, I don't know, we added six or seven or something, second year, 10 or something. But then it started getting to the point of 15, 20. And with the exception of the recession in 2009 and 10, uh, it was pretty consistent in those, you know, high teens, low twenties wow. units per per year, and um, you know, even in the recession, the only reason why it slowed down it wasn't for lack of interest. It was just there was no financing available sure. for people yeah. to get their business going. Wow! So I, I can't imagine because. I don't know. I've spoken with many entrepreneurs who are in the early stages of, of having a desire to franchise, and some are franchising. Um, that sounds really um, exciting, but also like 
huge, like overwhelming, stressful. Yeah. Um, it's hard. W- was it, were you just like, wow, we're doing this? I mean, you hit a hundred Were you just like, we just have a hundred. That had took a long time for us to hit hundred. Yeah. So <laughs> there's plenty of time for concern between, you know, you know, it's like as an entrepreneur, hiring your first employee and like figuring out what the business is going to look like and what's the, where are the gaps you get to fill? And as an entrepreneur, you, I, I have been, I find that most entrepreneurs are the kind of jacks of all trades. Like yeah. they're good at a lot of things and maybe amazing at one or two things. Uh, which tends to be around taking risk, yeah. But uh, they're really and bad at some things, right? And so it was like finding those holes that I needed to fill with the right people, and uh, you know, employee at a time. You start just building out your your HR team, and um, it's you know, it was it it was never easy. No, it wasn't. You know, never easy. Okay. The even, business, even as you're getting 50, 70, 80, it, it was. Didn't, your changes, your challenges just change. Hmm. Like what what's hard changes. The business, business is never easy because you've got people uh, you got to bring into the company and, and train and hire and grow with you. You've got, comp, yeah. you know, there's endless problem, you know, cash flow challenges. Uh, so early days, your your problems may be all around, like, how do I afford yeah. uh, a good person? And how yeah. can I fund that when I don't have the cash flow? And so do I find it through, raise money through debt, through investors or angel sure. financing? And then, so th- that changed up. Those problems changed now when you're really big and you have all these franchisees, you have a different set of issues. How do you manage 150 franchisees? Which we, we actually even got to 125 or so. Okay. Uh, territories we'd sold, and of those, it was in five countries. And gotcha. So in the U.S., I think we're at 85 to 95 okay. in the U.S. They're, today, they're around 220 or 230 okay. locations. Wow. Um, but so you're, you're gonna, you kind of trade off problems, right? Or how do you manage difficult franchisees, people who have really strong personalities, and, right. and they're they're a very loud voice in the network. And how do you manage that when you have younger franchisees that are growing up and you need to support them? And so you're, you're always trading problems off, right? Or now you've got too much money. You're making a lot of money. How do you spend? How do you spend that money? How do you reinvest it properly? What are the right investment decisions? It may be really obvious when you've got no resources. Sure. What you better do? I need a marketing campaign. Yeah, but I only have ten grand to do it. Right now, you've got a million dollars, and you can afford the marketing campaign. But the decision is now: what's the best marketing campaign? How to get the best ROI? And how do I grow my business faster? It's it's uh you know your problems are just changing. Did you see any um and, and this is your whole career so far? Have you ever gotten uh, found yourself less hungry, like uh, just comfortable, like hey we we've we've done well. I, I'm not a scrappy young bootstrapper anymore. Uh, I hope I never lose. <laughs> I have often been told uh, by people that know me well and people within our company that we have this in our culture the scrappy the scrappiness to it. Yeah, and I hope we never lose that. I I am um you know I grew up. Pretty poor, uh, like government housing kind of thing. Wow. Uh, at a very young age. My dad, at age 25, had five kids. Okay. And so, young father. Yeah, just working. Young working, mother. Surviving. They had their first child when my mom was 17, my dad was 18. Wow. And so, that's, you know, starting off, it was, it was hard. And, and I, looking back, I don't regret or look at any of that as a, as a bad thing. I, I loved my life growing up. I had a yeah. wonderful family and wonderful memories. But one thing I did know is that we were poor for a lot of it. Yeah, and there were times were really, really hard, and so I don't want to ever lose sight of that because I, I have a respect for money and having to earn that money and then using that wisely. Uh, I don't think I hope I never lose that. Gotcha. Sure. So you continue with the franchise and then you ultimately sold it. Yeah. Why? <clears throat> Why not keep it and keep going? <clears throat> That's a really good question. Um, one I've been asked a number of times. I think the number one reason that I sold the business was. Um, you know, having lived through 2010 and 11, uh, where you have like kind of a, a, um, a, um, a, an event that occurs that is existential for many businesses, you know, yeah. and, w- and watching a lot of people's businesses just completely de- just get decimated. Crumble, yeah. uh, having lived through that, we made it through that. And frankly, we grew through that actually quite well. We had uh, our same, sale, same store sales growth through that period was really ex- exceptional. Um, but what I learned was, that uh, things are more fragile than I thought. Huh. And uh, up until that point, I didn't really ever consider that moment, that, that something could happen that'd be that hard, right? You, you just feel invincible. Like, yeah, I'll just, just figure it out. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, we're going. smart people, we'll just sort it out. But when something happens that's completely out of your control and it just re- and you start to realize that you, know, you, you need to be prepared for things that are difficult like that, that you just can't control. I started thinking a little bit more about that. Uh, and then... The other issue is as you, as an entrepreneur, you're betting every day you wake up and you bet it all in black. Okay, 
you're betting it on yourself. Yeah. Okay. And that every day you walk out of the office and you come in and you, that's what you're doing. You're gambling everything you've built on right. that one thing when you only have one business. And at some point, that business becomes valuable enough that you start asking yourself the question, are the risks greater than the rewards? Gotcha. And for me, it came to that point where I said, the risks are pretty high. The rewards are really, really high. If I take this opportunity that was presenting itself, there's a way for me to uh, de-risk a lot of my life. And uh, it doesn't mean I'm retiring. Right, I, I'm right. very interested in being in business. Uh, in fact, I rolled. We were the very first uh, group that Neighborly allowed. They're called Neighborly now. They were sure. called Wire back then. We're the very first uh, company that they let roll their interest into the company. Wow. So when I sold, I, I literally, the question I asked of Mike Bidwell, the CEO at the time, who was an, an amazing individual, by the way, uh, I said to him, Mike, what is the most you'll let me roll in? And he said, a number. And I worked <laughs> as high as I could on that number. And he allowed me to do that, wow. and, uh, which, which, which was a very wise decision. They later on sold uh, for four years later at um, much more than I had rolled in at. And yeah. it became a, uh, a great blessing to our family and myself. Sure. And uh, they allowed us to participate in that. And so it wasn't for the lack of belief in the product or yeah. what we're doing. It was more about me de-risking my life. Sure. Taking some chips off the table. Yeah. Staying in the game and uh, creating value in other ways. Yeah. We, we still support all those franchisees of Five Star Painting. They're still friends of ours because I support them through Pernexus. That's awesome. Yeah. That's yeah, and I, I think that's a a lot of people struggle with that that question. When do we when do we mitigate some of the risk and take some off the table, right? When do we sell out and and, and move it over? Absolutely, yeah. That's a tough one. So um, let me ask you this: What before we go back to the story? What is success to you? Because some people, you know, have told me, well, why do you? I actually had a conversation a week and a half ago with one of my sisters. She says, well, why do you do what you do? I says, well, here's my plan. This is this. Well, why? Well, this is, you know, anyway, her point was, why don't you just be, she, why don't you just be happy with where you're at? Mm. And I try to get through to her. It's not that I'm not happy. It's just sometimes you have a vision. I have maybe a purpose, mm -hmm. but what is success for you? What is it? What is the goal for you in, in business? Why, why do you get up? You don't have to get up every day and come in here and maybe you don't, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't have okay. to. I do love it. Yeah. Um, let me just come back to that, that the comment you made sure. around happiness because I, in talking to a lot of entrepreneurs, I think we, we have, and, and for many people who are, you don't have to be an entrepreneur. You can be an intrapreneur, right? You don't right. have to be the person that runs it and owns it you can, or the founder. You can be entrepreneurial in an organization. <clears throat> I am generally unsatisfied. Huh. I'm very happy. So I am very happy with my life. I have a wonderful wife and I have a wonderful five children. I have great people I work with and business partners. I'm very happy in my life. I am generally unsatisfied in um, the status quo and only doing what I have now. I, I am always wanting to improve in every element of my life, whether it's my business, whether it's being a father, whether it's being a spouse, an individual, in any element of my life, I, I, um, I want to improve. I want to be better. Gotcha. It's, it's not going to, that will never end. And so that is, uh, for me, it's an iterative, an iterative pro process in a business as much as it is in a relationship sure. or as a uh, responsibility in, in a community. You want to be the best you can be, right? Yeah. So <clears throat> for me, that's what that is. It's trying to, um, you know, I don't have to come to work. I love coming to work. Yeah. I love innovating. I love creating value. And I think that is the other thing that is important part of this is that whatever I do in life, I, I want to feel like that I'm adding value to someone whether that be myself, my wife, my kids, my customers, my partners, right. I should be adding value to them in some capacity, in some way. And so that's what I focus on. Awesome, awesome. So you, you sell the company and then, and then what's next? Because I know that's definitely at the end. You talked about your company, Pronexus, mm -hmm. which was the support. So yeah. you start, do you just start shifting all your, your energy and focus towards this company, this Pronexus? Yeah, I mean, this is, this is taking up most of my time. Uh, I, have, I have a few other businesses that I'm involved in. Uh, I'm still in the franchising game. We have a bathroom remodeling company, okay. and we have a real estate concept as well that are both doing really well. They're housed in the same office space here uh, through Five Star Franchising. So it's Bath Solutions uh, and then um, Joe Homebuyer. Uh, and they're great business models. And so what I, when we sold the business, what I realized was up until that point, I was the CEO of everything. It was the painting business and Pronexus in its, in its unique form back then. Right. All of our lead generation stuff and marketing stuff and our software all was in one business. 
And I, I viewed it as this opportunity to provide focus. One of the challenges an entrepreneur has, and any, every individual, is, excellent, is excellence is only discovered in focusing yourself, right? <sighs> like if you, if you dilute yourself and over too many things, it's very difficult to, do, to find excellence. So I looked at the business. I said, I need to stop being the CEO of everything here. I need to take a core responsibility over ProNexus. Um, and then I needed to break out Five Star Franchising. And then my, my co-founder, Chad Jones, is the CEO of that. And he took on that business and he runs it. I support him and I'm like a, you know, a partner to him, but I have no operational day-to-day involvement. I, I'm more about how can I help and make introductions or right, maybe right. introduce a franchisee or something like that, right? And so all my focus went to ProNexus and it's paid off. Like, as you would expect, uh, when, you, when you put all your energy into something, you start solving problems and, you, and if it's always around creating value for those you service – then you're rewarded with more customers right. or you're rewarded with them staying with you. So, um, it, you know, it took, th- there was a big shift that had to happen when that yeah. occurred. I took that as an opportunity. Uh, you know, our business at the time was doing, you know, it was just begun 2015. January was the day one of ProNexus. Wow. Uh, today, I think we've got around 40 brands uh, that are home service brands that now use us. And, uh, you know, our, our, our whole vision and mission is to transform the home services experience for these customers with nice. their home service brands. And we do that through voice, so people calling in, uh, texting, uh, chat, and instant booking, creating technology that allows customers to book instantly for the home service provider uh, through an app or Kind of online. back to that initial problem you saw in the painting industry, just... It's the same issue. Yeah, same issue. You're just, mm-hmm. now you've got a software. So, so this software, this ProNexus is available for... Any service-based company? Yeah. I window mean, washing, house yep. cleaning? We do window washing. Oh. We do house cleaning. Okay. Yeah, those are all our customers. Snow, snow removal, anything I can say, you'll come yep. up? Okay. Uh, I'm pretty sure we have something in almost every category you're going to mention. Wow. Yeah, and it's cool, right? Because what's the theme that exists in all of them is the same. They are out there running their business. They don't have time to answer the phone. The value of the phone ringing and being answered is so great. Yeah. You've spent $150 to make the phone ring or to, to have someone engage with you online or to have someone text your phone number or to visit your app, whatever it may be. You've spent the money to get them there. Yeah. If your system does not respond immediately, okay, there is an exponential decrease in value to that customer opportunity. Yeah. So Pernexus steps in and says, stop worrying about all that stuff. We create all the technology, the systems. We have people trained to handle these and deal with the customers so we can book them, get the sale locked in, and have you keep doing your business. And do that 24-7. And do that at about a sixth of the cost of one full-time person. So you could pay for an assistant to just staff you nine to five, or you could pay me one-sixth of that, and I'll give you 24-7 support plus uh, an amazing technology portfolio that can help manage all that stuff uh, in, a, in a way that's efficient. Yeah, you got me sold. I think I need to get ProNexus. <laughs> you, you definitely need to get ProNexus. <laughs> oh, man. There's no question. Uh, yeah, count me in. Um, awesome. So I, let me ask you this. W- when, you're, when you're having to clear your plate a little bit, because do you feel like most entrepreneurs, I think you're kind of getting to this, they're just all over the place. Um, you know, we, anything shiny, hey, here it is, the new thing. Mm-hmm. I, I do it all the time. I've got myself in way too many things. How do you know if it's time to simplify? How do you sure. know if it's time to clear the plate a little bit and focus? To really, to really release the, your your potential. Um, I'm going to speak to this for just a minute on 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 a personal note, and then I'll, and maybe an example of someone that I've Perfect. dealt with that uh, I think would be apropos. So, so me individually, we talked earlier in our meeting. I own, I think it's seven companies. We counted out. Yeah. Okay. And of those seven companies, I also have, I'm on the boards of six other companies. I also advise uh, two funds that come to me to help them do these things. For me personally, I, I realize where do I add the most value to an organization? And I, that's how I view myself. How do I come into an organization, whether it's one I own or whether it's one I'm advising, and provide the most value, whether it's my network, whether it's my personal experience or business experience that can help things work for an entrepreneur? Sure. So just today, uh, a, a, a brand called Optimark, which is a printing brand, it's franchising, um, I was on a call with the founder. And that whole call was all about helping the founder that time. He just had his first child. Uh, the baby was born a couple of days ago. Oh, that's awesome. And so I've got a lot of personal experience with having five kids and, yeah. and, and being a father. And, and so some of my experience share wasn't just business, it was personal. Yeah. So I try to add a value to whoever I'm working with, right? Then there's this issue of focus. 
So someone could say, well, Scott, you're not, you're not even following your own advice. Here you are with seven companies and you're on six boards and how are you, how are you focused? And right. I would say, well, no, I am very focused in what I do. It's I do it, I spend that same energy and time with each things and any of the value that I can provide to them in that area. I'm, in a great, I'm a great advisor. I'm a great visionary. I'm not the guy that wants to be operating any longer. Yeah. I'm not the operator. Sure. I can advise the operator. I can add a lot of value to him and his operation for my life experience. So the other day, uh, a guy who does my sprinklers, his name's Cole, he's a great guy. And um, you know, you get, I, I like to help people and I could tell he wants to be an entrepreneur and he's like, hey, would you mind being my mentor? And I said to him, hey, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll happy to do that. Let's have a call every couple of weeks. Yeah. Happy to just help you through what you're doing. And he called me up the other day. You know, he sent me an email the other day. He said, Scott, give me, um, give me your, your favorite books, business books. I said, okay. So I sent him a couple, Jim Collins, Good, Great. Sure. You know, a couple of the, the books that, are, that everyone reads. I really liked that one a yeah, lot. Yeah, that was a good book. And uh, I think within five days or six days, he emailed me. Oh, that was amazing. Give me another book. What else can I read? And I said to him, Cole, don't read anything. Read that book again if you want to read another book. <laughs> now I want you to go in that book and I want you to find two or three things that you can read and then implement in your life. Do it. Do it, experience it, and then tell me what that's done for you. And when you've done that, I will give you another book. Yeah. And to that oh shiny moment, right? Like Cole, he's drinking from the fire hose. He's loving it. I want more. Yeah. But he's missing out on like, you need the focus. You have to, you have to execute. Get into execution stage. Stop thinking about ideas and, and how beautiful things may seem. Start getting the execution. And when that happens is where you get the traction in, as an entrepreneur. And I've had to deal with that. Like I've had, a, I've had learning moments in my career where uh, I've been distracted by oh shinies yeah. and that's taken me away from the core and I've had to come back to the home base and stay focused. And I still to this day, I'm constantly focusing in, in our own company, make sure that we are focusing on the things that, would, that matter most in the business. What are some of the oh shinies? Have you had any ridiculous ones? <laughs> oh shinies? <laughs> Uh, Everyone's got some. You're like, yeah, I mean, terrible ideas. Maybe you haven't. Um, I'm trying to. Th- I mean, I think I've started 25 companies in my career now, <laughs> and I think that. Um, I mean, I'll give you one that was no shiny. Uh, that was probably more of a funny story I can share yeah, with yeah, you. Yeah. Does that sound all right? That's what I want. Okay, good. So you know, we we start this painting company, and in that theme, uh, you know, in the painting industry, there's it's very seasonal, meaning that you know, right around uh, October, November, painting slows down a lot. And right around February, March, it picks back up. But in that three to four month window, things shut down. So we're iterating and thinking, how can we help these painters grow their business and be successful? And we're like, well, we can't change the, the market. I know, we'll deliver Christmas trees. Sounds like a great idea. I mean, oh, sorry. They, uh, they, uh, <laughs> so we had this bizarre idea that we would have our franchisees deliver Christmas trees to people's homes in uh, all the markets we had franchisees. And we started Five Star Christmas Trees. And uh, so I brought in a partner who had some experience in this and we, we launched it and uh, we be- quickly became the largest Christmas tree c- delivery company in North America. <laughs> the biggest. I'm I sure. mean, I think we delivered 25,000 trees to homes. Come in, set it up, put the star on, leave. Like Fraser Furs, the best trees. Yeah, yeah. These are Five Star Trees. Yeah. Sounds like a great idea, right? And we, it was during the Groupon phase, you know, the whole fad. Oh, so Groupon yeah. was killing it for us. We, did, we partnered with Amazon, we, we, uh, Google, we, and we were just crushing it. And uh, <laughs> it, there's no question it's true that we were slow in that time period. But what we learned was a few things. First of all, the funny story. We, del- we had 500 Christmas tree orders for Boston, Massachusetts. Okay. And so we would pallet these things up at the farm, ship them to the city, kind of like a hub spoke model. It arrives, and then we have white glove services come that would pick, take those trees and then deliver it to all the homeowners and then put the Christmas tree and we collect the money. And uh, the Grinch stole Christmas. This one delivery company, uh, we paid in ad- had to pay them 50% in advance. They took the 50% advance, and then they stole all 500 Christmas trees and sold them on the black market. Oh, my. And so one mistake in w- that one mistake, right, in that one year blew off our profit and made us lose money for that entire year. So here's the learning, right? Like 
in choosing a business, it seems like a good idea. And in fact, it was a good idea. Yeah. People want the service. People love the service. They love the trees for the most part. Uh, there were some challenges around delivery and timeliness, but we, we we're working through that. But like one mistake, you did it wrong. If you priced wrong, you couldn't fix it till next year. If you sure. picked the wrong delivery company, you had 12 months. You, it wasn't until next year you could fix it. Yeah. You had that one moment to make money. If you didn't make money, you, you blew it you all. missed it. And we kept doing that. Like something kept happening. Something went wrong every year. Like a Grinch stole Christmas or something that happened. And so we sold the business. Uh, it was like, you know, oh, shiny. seemed like a great idea. We, we, all this growth was happening. And we just realized that this model wasn't for us and we couldn't do it. So we shut it down. Oh, that's funny, man. I, I wonder what happened to all those people in Boston waiting for their 500 trees. Oh, I know what happened. Yeah. They called us. <laughs> yeah. Every single one of them. <laughs> and, we t- and we had a FedEx a lone Christmas tree from the farm to every single person to make sure they were happy. That's how you lost your shirt. And we lost our shirts yeah. on Yeah, wow. Yeah. Wow. I want to find that guy. I don't know where he went. <laughs> That's crazy. So you've got ProNexus going and some other things that you've mentioned. What keeps you excited and what keeps you wanting to continue to be an entrepreneur? Sorry, mm-hmm. I think I may have kind of, it might sound like a similar question. I was asking you, why do you do it? Hmm, maybe it's the same question. Is it the same question? That's all right. I guess I want to know, what, what, what gets you out of bed every day? Like, what are you yeah. excited about now? So, I mean, our mission is statement around transforming the customer experience, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, we want to be a thought leader. We want to be someone that is, that is transforming an industry that is trillions of dollars large, that has the same problem that exists all throughout the entire world. Yeah. And I want to be part of that transformation. I want to be leading that transformation. And that's exciting to me. So, um, you know, I, I, don't, I can't remember a time where I have ever woken up and not wanted to go to work That's when I awesome. worked for myself. I don't, I don't, I can't even put a finger on it. Even when it was hard, like the hard, hard, hard moments where you'd come to work. Like, um, we talked about earlier, some of the things that were really hard yeah. and, and, and it, something came to mind recently, um, it, it, I, I was reminded as an entrepreneur, hopefully this resonates for some of your listeners if it hasn't, they will have to deal with it at some point. But it was the very first time I had to fire somebody. Oh. Uh, probably, I, honestly, probably one of the hardest things I've ever done was the first time I had to fire someone. I've learned since way more about this, right? Yeah. And, uh, but I cried. Like, I, I'm not a crybaby, but I literally cried. <laughs> After, I bought the person flowers. <sighs> I mean, everything, right? Because I just felt so horrible. Um, and even on that day when I had to get up, get up and drive to the office and do that, I still loved going to work. Wow. It was, it was hard. I didn't want to do it, but I still loved what I was doing because it was, you know, creating something that was uh, really important and meaningful and yeah. being part of that was, uh, was wonderful. So. That's awesome. What, what's one of the, the hardest times that you've had? I mean, just over the years, so, you know, we've talked about a little bit, entrepreneurship is just can be a nightmare and we need support, mm-hmm. right? You talked mm-hmm. about your wife supporting you. What's one of the hardest times you've ever been through or anything come to mind? Any stories or anything sure, that you yeah. share? Yeah, I'd be happy to, to, to talk to that. But just maybe what I'll do is I'll speak and give a plug here for an organization I belong to sure. that I think uh, would help any entrepreneur that's dealing with difficult times. Uh, as an entrepreneur or as a CEO, often you can feel like you're very alone. It can be very lonely, uh, even when you have partners, because yeah. you know someone ultimately has to be the CEO. Right. Someone ultimately has to make the very difficult decisions, and and all of those can weigh on you, and you can lose sleep over. Right. And um, and so, I joined a group called the Entrepreneur Organization EO. I joined it in 2000 and uh, I think it was 2010. Okay. And I'll never forget this moment of clarity that arrived for me when uh, I, you know, I, the reason I joined the organization was because I kept meeting people that were EO members that I thought were just phenomenal, very authentic. Like we'd be talking and they'd yeah. be sharing things with me that were real. Yeah, yeah. Not like, hey, how are you doing? They're like, and they say, oh, business is killing yeah, it. I'm doing yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah. Right? yeah, there's tons of those okay, that guys happens. and girls out yeah, there. Yeah, they're out yeah. there. And I, I get it. We're self-promoting. We sure. want to make sure that everyone believes our brand's doing good. We got to make sales happen. Right, so I get right. that, right? But I'd have conversations with some of these people and they'd be like, dude, I'm in a cash crunch and uh, I haven't been paid for six months. I haven't made, and it may not make, make payroll this week and I'm going to have to let go of one of my top salespeople because I can't do it. And it's really hard. And I'd be like, wow, this is real. Let's talk. Yeah, like, yeah. I've got those experiences too. And, and I'd find out they're an EO member. I, that kept happening. Huh. I'd go to Canada someplace, I'd meet someone and it was like that. I'd go to someplace at a conference, I'd meet someone that was like that. And I, like the fifth time, I'm like, this is ridiculous. I, 
every, the, the common theme of these people that are authentic that can help me is EO. So I went online, I applied, I joined, I went to uh, these meetings where every month, once a month, I get together in a forum experience, like a mastermind experience. It's me and six, seven, eight other people. And uh, we spend some time sharing what's going on in our lives. Sometimes it's personal, sometimes it's business. It, it could be anything, right? And I remember this epiphany that I had because up until this point in time, roughly uh, 10 years ago, I thought no one thought like me. I truly yeah. believed, and I sure. really sincerely mean this, I'd never met anyone that I felt thought like me, that inside the head were saying some of the things, some, some of the self-doubt stuff and some of the positive things, yeah, yeah. irrational exuberance and irrational positive. Right, the ups and, and, and the And then downs, yeah. also the times where like, things are all going to implode and I'm a really horrible human being yeah. and, I'm, and I'm a fraudster because I'm, I'm making people believe I'm successful but I'm not actually. I may not make it. Right. So there's these huge dichotomies of, of experience, okay? And up until then, uh, I had never met anyone that was like me. And then I was in one of these meetings and I heard each entrepreneur share some story that was very sincere and authentic around what was really going on in their life and their business. And I just, it hit me. I'm like, oh my gosh, I found my tribe. I found people that are like me. And that became foundational to my success. Because wow. from then on, it was very liberating as well. When you start to realize that we all have these fears. Yeah. Okay, we all have some... Yeah some challenges around our businesses. You're not alone in this. You're not alone. And not just that, but you learn from all of their learning. So they have a life experience that may be very negative or positive. I can take from that and pull it into my life. And so I started making some real personal changes and business changes in my business that were transformational. So, wow. um, so that was, I think, really important. Uh, but other hard moments, right? I mean, clearly firing someone's not the first time is really difficult. Uh, living through the recession in 2010, yeah. 2011, uh, you know, really, really, really hard. Um, this most recent experience we had where COVID hit. Yeah. And, um, you know, how do you navigate that? How you make, you know, you learn from all those experiences. Is this going to be 2011 all over again? Right. Don't make the mistake of not acting soon enough. And so uh, those are hard things to do. But it, it, the more you do hard things, the easier hard things become. So yeah, uh, in, just like Wim Hof, if you're going to have a whole cold shower every day, by the fiftieth time, it's not that big a deal. I never got that far, but yeah, it's I get not, the concept. It's not that big a deal, right? It was hard the first couple of times, <laughs> yeah. which is actually why I do it. By the way, yeah. I'd rather get up in the morning and look at the hardest thing I have to do today is turn the water onto yeah. cold and jump in it. So that's the hardest thing. Do you time your cold showers? Did you? Yeah, I mean, it's two three minutes. Okay, my, yeah. I mean, I just know because my wife like keeps a timer. She did yeah, like, you can do she'll that. She'll do eleven minutes, thirteen minutes. <laughs> sure. I'm like, all right. Yeah, crazy. I mean, I mean, I don't get that, and I'm not that. Okay. I okay. mean, the idea for me is more about yeah. being able to do hard things first thing in the day or, yeah. or whatever that is. So gotcha. Yeah. What was it? What about your children? Do they? You know, they're getting older. Mm -hmm. Are any of them entrepreneurs? Did that did that kick on to them? So my oldest boy is 20. He's serving an LDS mission in Alabama right now. Um, <laughs> and he's, uh, you know, he's, he's loving a, it. Uh, yeah. I mean, he's, uh, he's heading up their social media campaigns for the church. Uh, that's, that's funny. The church has had to do that with the change around COVID. Uh, they, they can't, as all, some of your listeners may have recognized those guys walking around with the tags on. They yeah. knock on doors normally. Well, they can't do that in COVID times. So they've had to innovate. And so he's been right. one of the first to do that for their, their that's area. Cool. And that's he, cool. It's all online. He, he's created over 135 uh, commercials uh, th for the church that he's using to engage with people on different topics. That's awesome. And I'm very proud of him. Yeah. Uh, and I secretly think he is an entrepreneur. Yeah. I don't think he's realized that yet. Yeah. Um, uh, he worked for me for a little bit before he left and uh, he was a great addition to our team and I'd love to have him if he'd, if he'd come back to me. Uh, my daughter is, uh, and I've got four of the kids, she's just going to college right now to be an accountant. Once again, they all have the entrepreneurial flair. Like, you know, some people get into entrepreneurship for uh, economic reasons. Like they want the big house and a yeah. nice car. Yeah, 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 for sure. And some people get into entrepreneurship because they're just solving a problem. Yes. And they just want to, they just want to take care of that problem. It bothers them. And sometimes it's a passion thing. Like I'm just passionate about fishing, so I'm going to do it. It's not a problem. I'm just passionate about it. There's lots of different reasons why people do things. And I'd say all my kids are very passionate, very intelligent, and very good people. And I think they could all be dragged into entrepreneurship yeah. for any one of those things. And it might be because they want a nice car too. I mean, right. I, got, I got a kid that it, he loves nice cars and, and I happen to drive some of those nice cars. <laughs> and so he's motivated by a nice car. Yeah. And, you know what? and I would say whatever motivates you, 
uh, use that, but as long as you keep in the in in your who you are as an individual, this idea that you should be adding value and and growing in that process, then you'll be successful. Yeah, that makes sense. If if one of them came to you and said, "Hey, Dad, I want to start a company," mm-hmm. what would be your? I mean, there's uh, you've already shared a lot of advice, a lot of great takeaways. What would be the thing, the thing or two that you'd say? Do this. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, it's probably a lifelong thing, and I would say to all my kids that. Uh, Invest in yourself always. Yeah. Never stop investing in yourself. You're the one thing that they can never be devalued. It's actually something it comes from Warren Buffett, this this yeah. piece of advice. Okay, it's not just mine. I don't want to own it. But uh it's why I took an I did an undergrad, it's why I did a master's. Uh I never needed either of those things to get a job. I haven't used them to get a job. I've been working for myself. But I've been improving who I am as an individual and my capabilities and talents and honing those for the purpose of the business I'm running. So I would, I would want all of my kids to know that you have to invest in yourself, that education is really important. However you find that, you don't have to do university. There are many ways of doing that, like these podcasts, are, I'm sure, yeah. are very educational for people, life experience. So I hope they never lose sight of that because if they keep investing in themselves, they'll be in a position where they can be successful in whatever career or business they decide to pursue. Gotcha. Okay. Awesome, man. Um, Kind of just wrapping up, I just got a few few questions. Um, one of them I wanted to ask you, you mentioned earlier your brother who, who stayed in Canada and works for the company. Mm. He, did you ever offer him a job? <laughs> <laughs> or can you not work with your siblings? Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm really close with my siblings. You want to keep it that like way? They are, uh, I love them to death, and, we, um, and I do want to keep it that way. Uh, I've flirted, I've hired my brother. One of my brothers is an actuary. I've hired him as a consultant on okay. multiple occasions on Excel work and stuff like that. Yeah. And uh, my other brother, I've asked many times on networking things for advice. And uh, But uh, it's not that I don't want to work with him. I don't know if they would want to work with me, frankly. Yeah. It just uh, hasn't come up. Huh? It just, it's one of those things that you know we run our respective lives and um, we it, love each other a lot. But it's um, I don't know if they would want to work for an entrepreneur organization like mine. Yeah. You know, it, There's a lot of risk associated <laughs> with this thing. They lived it as kids growing up. I don't yeah. know if they want that again. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. What are some of the things that you love to do for just for fun? Like when you've got some spare time, you're not building companies, you're not doing anything. What, what, where are we going to find you? Yeah, uh, I've got a lot of passions in life. Um, so up until recently, soccer was one of them. I've traveled the world, uh, seen soccer games in in Spain, in France, in Belgium, in England, uh, awesome. in, in Italy. And uh, in Brazil, I was there for the World Cup. Wow. Uh, I played a lot, and I wish I could still play, but I've had uh, knee injuries from soccer, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. So uh, soccer's been a huge passion. Uh, outdoors, fishing. I do a lot of wake surfing. Uh, I spend probably 120 hours every summer surfing. <laughs> uh, whether I'm surfing in Hawaii or whether I'm surfing behind my boat, I do a lot of that. I do a lot of mountain biking and yeah. some pretty hardcore stuff. Uh, uh, it. You'd think one of my passions is, it, passions is breaking myself because I broke my rib this year, I blew my right <laughs> knee out, and I had shoulder surgery. All my right side of my body has been decimated this year from mountain <laughs> biking and wheelbarrow racing and and uh, all kinds of things that go soccer and yeah. um, that kind of stuff. I, I do a lot of backcountry snowboarding. Yeah, so you whether said that's heli, heli skiing and heli like boarding, that, yeah, uh, or cats. You get you jump in a cat, they take you in the middle of nowhere, and you dump them, dump you off. Um, I've gotten into spear fishing as we were talking earlier with the shark stories. Uh, I like to live life to the fullest. I mean, I really, for me, it, it's, you know, if you, you could pretty much come in and say, hey, Scott, I want to go do some kind of adventure. And if it was adventuresome anywhere in the world and it sounded pretty cool, I'd probably be down. Yeah. <laughs> like I've never spearfished ever. Okay. Coming to that topic. Never been, I've done lots of snorkeling. I'm, I'm a pretty good swimmer. I've been doing the Wim Hof thing so I can hold my breath to almost five minutes now. That's impressive. And uh, so a buddy of mine, he's the founder of Code Epoxy. I don't oh, know if you cool. know that company. Yeah, 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 great company. Oh, very cool. Stefan Jacob. He's a, an amazing individual. They make great products. It looks uh, great product and great company. They do good, right? Yeah, they great seem motto. to have a good, they have a good, yeah, and they have a good uh, culture and mm-hmm. core. Amazing culture. He's an amazing individual. And he's like, hey, Abbott, we're going to take uh, five guys. We're going to fly into Dunriga, uh, Belize, and we're going to uh, take a small little boat, which is the scariest part of the whole thing, five hours in the middle of the ocean to find some atoll. We get dropped off on this island and we're only going to eat what we kill and we don't have any matches to make fire. And uh, 
I said, I'm in. Like, I'm so in. <laughs> like, oh, I can't wait. I've never spearfished, but I'm pretty sure I'll kill something. I mean, Whatever, right? Yeah, something. So it was, uh, I mean, amazing experience. We don't have to get into it too much detail, but so, you know, the things that you'll, where you'll find me yeah. doing things, it's probably involved with some other people that I respect, that I want to connect with and, and a relationship with, to experience something with, whether it be my own team members at my cabin, my family, close friends, somewhere in the world experiencing something really, really cool. That's awesome. So. My last question for you, if you are stuck on an island and you get one book, one album, and one meal, okay, uh-huh. what's it going to be? Oh, boy. So, um, well, one book, I, I, I'm a pretty spiritual guy. Yeah. So I would probably go with either the Bible or the Book of Mormon. Uh, and those would be, for me, be interchangeable. Both of them are very inspiring. And there's a reason why the Bible is as old as it is. Yeah, it's uh, lasted. The, the, their, the Book of Proverbs has um, got uh, stuff that I would hope to have to be able to pass on to my children. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, but, you know, aside from that, I, I, I think I'd probably... Um, I don't know whether it would be some of my journals I've got as well. I don't know. Life's experiences I've documented that I want to have with me. Uh, that, those, those would be the books. Uh, one album you said, right? Yeah, one album. So I didn't mention this, but I'm like a hardcore U2 fan. Oh, and I wow. know, don't hold this against me, okay? Because no, I know dude. they're like fabricated and, Look, they, you know, it's got like all kinds of issues, right? But all that He's you political. can't leave behind, mm. that album is perfect. I have every album they have. I can play most of their songs Joshua on the guitar. Tree, perfect. And I would take Joshua Tree with me. Yeah. Uh, yeah it's, that, it's, a, it's a very spiritual album. Yeah. Uh, and they've got some songs in there that I've connected with in my teenage life. Sure. That are uh, amazing. But I've traveled the world watching you too. I've actually held Bono in my arms. <laughs> uh, you know, a ble- unbelievable, right? But it, I'll never forget going to Minneapolis um, <laughs> with my uh, now wife back then we were dating and, and, uh, this is a, a kind of a funny story, so I'll tell. Is that okay? You got to, man. Okay, you got to hear it because Bono, right? Uh, so anyways, we get, to the, we get to the concert and like I've dyed my hair orange and I got a goatee down to here and it's dyed orange and bleached out and we got all like the, it was a lemon concert and so I had the, the lemon t-shirt and, yeah. and um, we get there and my buddy, James Gregg, who was one of our franchisees actually at Five Star Painting later on, he, um, he's an amazing guy and he said, uh, I bought these tickets for front row seats and I'm like, oh, I'm in, I'm in. So, we bought the tickets. We get to the concert. It was front row seats in the nosebleeds, oh, not front row seats on the floor. No, 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 so no, it's no. me and like, you know, I think there was 10 of us. And we were like just re- coming to the realization that we're, we are sitting in the nosebleeds at a U2 concert. And we're all hardcore fans. And there's a security guard there. And the girls start crying. My, my wife included in this category. She's a hardcore fan as well. Yeah, yeah. And we... Can, proceeded to convince the security guard that we had done wrong and that they needed to take care of us. And I don't know how we did it, but we did. He escorted us to the front row and put us in front of the front row. Oh my. And as I looked behind me, there's all these rich people that can afford the front row seats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there's us who are the hardcore fans and we're on the, we're just pounding the, 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 uh, the concert floor and and Bono is playing to us the entire night. He just thinks this is the coolest thing. One of the girls that was with us gets pulled up on the stage. He does the whole thing, you know, sprays champagne over her. Yep. Just before, I think, third or last song, he jumps out and crowd surfs with us. And it's just me and my buddies holding him. <laughs> and we're all like, and Bono's like, yeah. We're like, yeah, Bono. <laughs> I don't think he recognized me, but I did do it. And so uh, you two, Joshua Tree would be my album for sure. <laughs> There's no question that'd be the one that's I'd have awesome. On, on that would that actually one. that's in my top ten. Oh, it's got to be right. Yeah, that, that's incredible. Wow, that's yeah. a good story. Yeah. And what was your other question? Uh, meal. What's the food? Uh, so, little known fact about me: I'm celiac. Mm. So, uh, I, I can't eat anything with gluten in it. I discovered that actually the the year I sold my company when I was 40, I turned 40. I was driving to a steakhouse to celebrate that we were just signing this deal. It was with my wife, my business partner, and his wife. The doctor called and said, we got your results back. You're celiac. You can't eat bread anymore. No gluten. That's, gone. That's like... Uh, if you know Brian, Brian Regan, the comedian who talks about you know, being told you can't have dairy. I haven't heard that. You know, you, you, be gone happiness. Like you've just lost yeah, happiness. Say, okay. Yeah, why bother? Yeah, so why bother? Just <laughs> why give up right? then. So if I could have that last meal and I knew it would be the last yeah, one, yeah, yeah. I, I'd probably pick something in the bread category. Um, I'm a huge... I lived in France for two years. Nice. And I fell in love with the French patisseries. And there's a few things on that list 
millefeuilles and, and pain au chocolats and stuff like that that are um, I love, but I just don't eat any longer. So mm. it'd be in that category. Mm. Sorry about the celiac, man. That's brutal. It's all right. I, I lost like 10 pounds. I've kept it off since, and it's <laughs> been good for me. You know what? Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah, I'm with you on that. Um, well, thanks, man. I appreciate your time and, and your stories and, and some of the lessons you've shared. I think there's some really solid stuff. I, I could probably ask, even on a personal level, there's probably another hour of questions that I, I have. Um, but, but uh, you know, we got to keep it digestible. You sure, know what I mean? Yeah. We got it. We keep, we keep it in an area. But, uh, but thanks again. Um, yeah, I guess if you guys uh, want to learn more about him, um, just do what I did. You can go online. And you, I can Google you, and I saw. Sure. You can see his videos. Kind of a stalking thing. I saw his videos, and you can. But if you want to learn more, because he's got a lot of knowledge, there's a lot of great wisdom here. Um, you can see him, you know, teaching at UVU. You can see him on a stage. Mm -hmm. Maybe that was at UVU too. I'm not sure. Yeah, I've I've lectured at UVU and BYU yeah. and a few other places. Yeah. If I could do a plug, please, if that's all right, plug, just yeah, because can, absolutely, uh, man. I just recently launched a, a a a program called the Home Services Summit. Oh, it's yeah. this idea that uh, home services companies need great content, very hyper-focused on them. And uh, every month on the first Thursday of the month uh, at 11 o'clock a.m. Mountain Center time, I interview people who are the experts in the home services category to give us great content on, on that. And then our first summit is actually in February 4th and 5th. It's going to be virtual this first time where uh, franchisors and franchisees of home service companies are invited to come and learn about some of the good things that are happening in this industry. So that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, that's, that's a great work, man. So thanks again. I hope you guys have enjoyed this episode with Scott Abbott and um, we'll see you on the next episode of the company next door. Thanks, man. Yeah. Thanks for having me.